All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome again to another installation of uh, NB Heart Center CV Weekly Rounds. And uh, this week, um, I wanted to invite uh, one of our uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Dr. Christina Edwards Lee. Uh, she's our clinical resource pharmacist here for the New Brunswick Heart Center. And by way of history, she um, has uh, is originally from uh, Labrador, Newfoundland, and has uh, worked uh, at the London Health Sciences Center and um, did her PhD in, in, in pharmacy at the University of Waterloo at, in the Vanguard program there. And uh, we're quite fortunate to have her as part of our team. I know definitely from a cardiac surgical perspective, uh, we are hugely uh, reliant on her and her expertise. And it has made, I think, a, an extremely positive um, impact on our program, just in terms of the, not only just the medication management, but the overall medical management of our patients. So um, for that, uh, we are thankful, and I thought it would be a good time to kind of go over the uh, ever-evolving management uh, of diabetes, which uh, honestly uh, has changed so dramatically from when I was a resident. Now it's not uncommon to see people on insulin and three or four different oral hypoglycemic agents. So I thought not only would it be a good chance to review some of this, but also to look at where it is that you know it is going and what we should really have our patients on given the fact that at least 30 to 40% of our patients who are undergo cardiac surgery, if not in cardiology or as a whole are diabetic. So without further ado, I will pass it over to Christina. Thanks, Ansar. Um, so as you mentioned, I'm gonna talk a little bit about diabetes, uh, what has changed and kind of what's also stayed the same since the last uh, guideline update. So diabetes prevalence in Canada is about 10% currently of people who are diagnosed. Um, People who are undiagnosed, including people who are pre-diabetic, counts for about 30% of the population. Uh, within New Brunswick, it's a little bit higher, so about 12% um, based in 2019 were diagnosed and 33% in that group of pre-diabetes and undiagnosed as well. Over the next uh, 10 years, they're expecting about a 30 to 31% increase in the people who um, are uh, diagnosed. So you can imagine that that's going to have a huge impact on our healthcare system and including um, the cost and just the number of patients that we may be seeing with the complications, renal complications and uh, cardiac, obviously. So today I'm going to overview the guidelines um, and then the 2020 update that was focused just on type 2 drug therapy, what to start and when. There has been some new evidence even since the update was put out. Uh, I'll overview a couple of the trials that are out. Um, and then there's two ongoing trials uh, that I'm aware of, at least that for empagliflozin and dapagliflozin for patients with preserved HF. So those are ongoing, um, no results for those yet. And then I'm gonna touch a little bit on drug coverage, just cause it is a common issue that we have um, within the hospital when we're trying to get patients on the right treatment. So as you know, guidelines were updated in 2018. Everything is very easily found on the Diabetes uh, Canada website. Um, and then they put out the update in 2020. And this has just been because there's been so much uh, new evidence come out in the past uh, couple of years. Obviously the most of the focus is on the um, SGL2 inhibitors, um, but the guideline pretty much, uh, they put out the new update to help, um, help to triage the patients in terms of that there's so much now cardiac, um, cardiorenal evidence out there. And that was the reason that they put out the update. So A1C targets, they haven't changed. They're still the same. Uh, most patients were still gonna be targeting 7% uh, or less. If the patients are considered high risk for CKD uh, and low risk for hypoglycemia, we can target as low as 6.5%. Diagnosis is still considered 6.5% and higher. Uh, patients who are more frail, so are more elderly patients uh, or those at more risk for the hypoglycemia or would be aware of, of having hypoglycemia, we can target as, as high as 8.5. So I'm gonna go over a couple cases to kind of go through the algorithm that is in the, uh, the 2020 update. So just to, to start, so a common patient that we do see uh, within the heart center and within I'm sure all the, the cardiac um, hospital inpatients. Uh, so a six year old male presents to hospital with an NSTEMI. He's not on currently on an, any medication, but he does have hypertension and dyslipidemia. No previous family history, no previous known CAD, and is a non-smoker. So random glucose uh, was checked when he came in, is 12.3. Uh, a keen resident decided that he, he needed an HbA1c done, and it's uh, 7.5. So now we have a new diagnosis of diabetes. Uh, now what do we do? So per the guidelines, 
it's recommended make sure that the patient still has the overall care of um, making sure that they get educated, that they have diabetes, that they're referred to diabetes education, uh, and that they're talked about lifestyle changes, um, things that they can do to help reduce their glucose levels. So a lot of times a dietitian uh, would be helpful with that. If it's believed that the patient won't be able to achieve this with just lifestyle changes, um, or their A1C is um, a little bit higher than the, just at the 6.5 mark, then it would be recommended to start metformin. If they do have a A1C, which is higher than uh, 1.5 above the target, um, they recommend starting a second agent with that. So that's about eight to 8.5%, they'd recommend starting a, a second agent. And then as per the same, make sure you're checking the A1C in about three to six months, usually three months. The reason that metformin is still considered first line um, is that it's relatively inexpensive. Uh, most people tolerate it fairly well and it does provide a decent um, glucose control throughout the entire day. There is a bit of outcome data for new di newly diagnosed patients who are obese. So there is a decrease in mortality and a decrease in MI um, over a 10 year period. And that was through the UK PDS studies. So for the second part of the algorithm, another case. So common patient that we see uh, fairly often, at least on the surgical side, a uh, 65 year old female admitted to hospital with unstable angina is now post-op day three from uh, cabbage. So it has a previous end STEMI, hypertension, dyslipidemia, hypothyroid, depression, and type two diabetes. The only medication that she's on right now for uh, diabetes is metformin 850 BID. So when we did her pre-op, um, HbA1c was 7.8% and creatinine's normal. And then currently on day three, her glucose is ranging from 6.9 to 13.1. It's a very common question, what's the best option for a second agent to start? And this is where um, the guidelines uh, significantly updated. So HUA1C not at target. If the patient has um, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, CKD, heart failure, or is above 60 with two CV risk factors, and then the CV risk factors are considered um, tobacco, hypertension, or dyslipidemia, then it's add or substitute another agent with demonstrated cardiorenal benefit. For our patients who come in with uh, NSTEMI or cardio um, sort of CAD, then most of the time you could use a GLP-1 receptor agonist or an SGLT2 inhibitor. And on average, they're considered any of the, most of the group, at least the SGLT2s, any of the three would be fine. The GLP-1s, um, semaglutide, liraglutide, and dilaglutide would be the ones that you could use in that instance. If they have CKD or heart failure, uh, we just stick with the SGLT2 inhibitors at that point. And if they're considered just at risk of having cardiovascular events, they don't have any current um, issues or any um, ongoing history, then the GLP-1s would be good or the um, SGLT2s are an option as well. The one benefit with the GLP-1 uh, receptor agonists is that they do have a greater um, percentage of weight loss with them compared to the other agents. So if it is something that's needed, uh, for that patient, then it is a good option. A lot of times patients are a little hesitant because it is injections, um, the liraglutide or victosas every day, and then semaglutide or ozempic is once a week. So sometimes you can get some patients on board, especially when you sell it um, for the weight loss part of it, unfortunately. Uh, for which if that's an option. And then uh, the other side of the diagram over here, it kind of explains a little bit of which ones have the best evidence for um, cardiorenal benefit, they're safe in terms of cardiovascular, but no benefit, and then the risk of heart failure. So you'll see saxagliptin is over here, higher with the risk of heart failure. Uh, the DPP-4 inhibitor, so citagliptin, linagliptin, um, they're safe, but they don't really have any benefit. And that's the same with the sulfonurias um, and insulin you'll see on the bottom here. Uh, the ones at the bottom in red, they're considered uh, not as good options, mainly because they just have higher risk of hypoglycemia and they don't have as much evidence for them. And then thio, um, the thiazides we don't really use anymore, the pioglitazone, I haven't seen somebody on that in years because of the risk, obviously. So this is another uh, graph that the um, update included. And so it's a bit of, it's a summary of all the trials that have the cardiorenal benefits. And this was done as of October, 2019. Since then, obviously there's been a couple new updates. But as you can see for most half the SGLT2 inhibitors have good um, evidence kind of across the board for uh, MACE, CV mortality, progression of CKD and um, heart failure. 
the ones that are best for the GLP-1 uh, receptor agonists are uh, the semaglutide, diliglutide, and uh, liraglutide of Victoza. There is also um, an oral one now of semaglutide. It is uh, crazy expensive, uh, so I haven't seen anybody start on it yet, but it may be an option um, uh, down the road once it hopefully it gets a little cheaper. So this is um, adapted from, well, it's taken from the Heart Failure Society. And it's a, it's a good um, graph of how to start an SGLT2 inhibitor for, for patients who have cardiovascular disease. So patients who have a diagnosis or um, chronic kidney disease with an EGFR less uh, greater than 25, or they have reduced um, ejection heart failure, the, these are good considerations for these patients. The reasons that we wouldn't want to start it is if they have current chronic uh, limb ischemia, their EGFR is less than 25, or they obviously have an allergy. Uh, instances where we would want to wait to start an SGLT2 inhibitor would be if they're currently volume depleted, they have an active uh, genital infection or yeast infection, they are hypotensive, they've had prior um, limb ischemia, and obviously currently in DKA, we don't want to be starting that with these patients. For outpatient treatment, especially for heart failure, we would want to start dapagliflozin and ampagliflozin at 10 milligrams once a day, and you don't need to change those doses, and or canagliflozin at 100 milligrams uh, once a day. If you're using it for uh, type 2 diabetes, then you can go on the higher doses of the ampagliflozin and the canagliflozin, so uh, Jardians 25 or canagliflozin 300. Um, providing that the renal function is good. You can get a little bit better glucose control throughout the day, but there's not that much of a difference from the 10 milligrams, uh, the lower doses to the higher doses. Um, make sure that the patient is aware that they are at increased risks for, uh, for genital infections, yeast infections. Um, it does happen fairly, fairly, not fairly frequently, but enough that uh, patients usually do need a couple doses of fluconazole when they first start. Um, and then renal function is another thing that we want to watch out for and just follow as they're on the treatment. Patients can lose a little bit of weight while they're on this, but not um, a substantial amount. And uh, when we start these agents, if they are pretty well controlled at the time when we do start it, so their A1C is considered less than 7.5, you can consider a dose reduction of, of their insulin if they're on it, um, decrease the sulfonylurea if they're on it, or just stop it altogether. And if they're on a DPP-4 inhibitor, just get rid of it altogether and replace it with an SGLT2 inhibitor. Um, if they're pretty still having pretty high glucose readings, they're not well controlled, then it's okay just to add and uh, follow up as, as we go. One thing to mention is the recommendations for surgery patients is it's recommended to stop the SGLT2 inhibitor about 72 hours prior to surgery. Uh, we kind of go 48 to 72 hours. Um, and then after surgery, it's recommended to stop out for about 48 to 72 hours for major surgeries. And that's just to help decrease the risk of the euglycemic DKA for those patients. So one of the trials that was not included in the update was the Emperor Reduce trial. I'm sure most people are pretty familiar with it now. Um, so it's empagliflozin for cardiovascular and renal outcomes in heart failure. So as with all the other ones, it showed uh, good results for CV mortality and uh, decreased in hospitalization for heart failure. So that was released in October. And then another one that just came out a couple of weeks ago, it's, it's Sotagliflozin. It's not yet on the Canadian market, not yet in the US either, but it's a, I believe it's listed in the UK now. But it's a, a new one uh, in the SGLT2 slash one, I guess, inhibitor group. So it actually has two different mechanisms that it uses. So it uh, inhibits glucose absorption through the intestine and also um, glucose reabsorption through the kidneys. Um, it has been proven beneficial for patients with heart failure. Same type of evidence that we're seeing for all the other ones in that group. So it'll be uh, interesting to see what happens with it when it does come to market in Canada, which I would imagine won't be too long from now. And they are actually even studying it for our uh, type 1 diabetic patients as well. So when the patients get a little more complicated, uh, we look at different options. So for this case, uh, there's a 75-year-old male. He's admitted for a cabbage AVR from home. When we do his reaching out in blood work, we notice that his blood glucose is 24.3. It's unbelievable how much this actually happens when they come into hospital. Um, the OR is planned for the next morning. Um, so he has hypertension. He has heart failure, dyslipidemia, diabetes, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and a baseline CKD with his creatinine being about 150. Currently for his diabetic medications, he's on metformin 500 and citagliptin 50 daily. 
So those are adjusted based on his renal function currently. So HbA1c is 12.1%. So what's the plan before surgery? And you, thinking forward, what would be the plan at discharge? So for in-hospital uh, management, we need to be ensuring that we're checking everyone's A1C if it hasn't been done in the last three months. Uh, it's unbelievable how many patients are newly diagnosed diabetics when they come to us from home um, for, for surgery. So obviously somewhere along the lines, either something has missed or um, either the patient just didn't want to start therapy. So there's, there's obviously always multiple options at that point, but it just kind of... Um, reinforces the fact that we are missing a fair bit of patients with, this, with the diagnosis. Uh, for patients who come into hospital, we use insulin as the treatment of choice, especially when they're um, having hyperglycemia. It's ideal not to start insulin sliding scale alone at that point, and it is recommended to do a basal bolus plus a correction insulin regimen. Obviously, that is when we have time to do that. If the patient's going for surgery the next morning, we don't have that option most of the time. So what we have done in the past is we've just given them a bit of sliding scale to cover uh, for when we first start. If we're not getting them well controlled within about four to six hours, then we would start an insulin infusion at that point. And the main reason we use the insulin infusion uh, for our patients is uh, because of the reduced risk of surgical site infections. Um, and this has been proven for patients undergoing cabbage through multiple different studies. Uh, the insulin infusion protocols, they all target an uh, glucose between 5.5 and 11.1. And we can use them up to three days post-op for, or the studies have done up to three days post-op using the insulin infusions. So when we decide to start insulin, make sure that the patient gets good teaching. That's the one big thing and make sure that the patient is uh, able to even do the insulin themselves. Uh, as the patients get more frail, sometimes their dexterity is not there, their eyesight's not as well. So they, they wouldn't be able to necessarily even dial on the pen to get the right dose. But we can do, uh, so what's recommended to do is the basal insulin to start. And then we can add metformin, continue that unless we can't use it based on either renal function or the patient can't tolerate it. And then we can add our GLP-1s, SGLT-2s, and you can add the other um, ones as well. But obviously for our cardiac patients, we'd like to be targeting either one of those two groups. There is um, some products out there now that are uh, GLP-1 slash some of the long acting insulins. I haven't seen too many patients on them yet because they're a fixed dose for most of it. So it's mostly what it's marketed for seems to be for patients who need to start insulin but don't want the weight gain. So they're trying to offset the weight gain with adding the GLP-1s to them as well. If you're on basal uh, bolus insulin and then you're trying to add um, other agents, then you can start to add the bolus insulin. So with the meals at that point in time, and when you get to that point, if they're still on a sulfonuria, it's advised to stop it just to reduce the risk of hypoglycemia at that point in time. And then as with anything, continue to check their A1Zs at about three months from then. So as a follow-up for case three, patients now six days post-op, creatinine has jumped to 350. So EGFR is about 22 mils per minute. Common scenario that we do have happen. Uh, what are your options at that point? So this is from the 2018 guidelines. It goes over um, which agents are um, appropriate in which GFRs. You'll see green is good, yellow use with caution, red is a no-go. Uh, the one thing that has changed is the SGLT2 inhibitors. We use them all down as low as an EGFR of uh, 30 now, which is uh, safe to do. That's been proven in a couple of studies. So one, another one that came out in October as uh, dapagliflozin with chronic kidney disease. This was in patients with or without um, diabetic, without diabetes. Uh, and they studied the patients as low as an EGFR of 25 to start, and they stayed on dapagliflozin 10 milligrams right until the point that they started dialysis. So it went down as, as less than 15 mils per minute for an EGFR. So it's proven that they're fairly safe and they're pretty effective um, in this population. Uh, the one thing that they were looking for was um, reduced time to start dialysis, EGFR increasing by 50% and then death from cardiovascular or cardiorenal causes. So that was the primary outcome for the study. And then the um, empagliflozin one is currently ongoing but I would imagine um, it will see similar results with that. Just a quick blurb on basal insulins. Um, there's a few different ones out on the market. Most of you are aware of all of them. Basalglar is the one that's taken over for Lantus, mainly because it's cheaper. 
um, it's considered um, pretty equivalent to it. Um, and then the new one that's on the market is Triceba, so Daglutec. Its claim to fame is that it has a lower risk of hypoglycemia. It has a duration of up to 42 hours. The one thing with that is that trying to dose adjust is we can't do it every we can't do it every day. We have to do it usually about every three days. They recommend just because it takes that long to kind of see the, the benefit of it. And then a quick thing about drug coverage. So drug coverage is a bit of a pain, as I'm sure you're all aware. So through the provincial drug plan, and then this crosses over to Blue Cross because they run the same formulary. Patients who want to be on an SGLT2 or we want to have them on an SGLT2 inhibitor um, have to always be on metformin as a baseline. So another reason that we need to have patients on metformin. Um, if they have established coronary artery disease, they only need to be on metformin, um, which is, most patients would be. If they don't have established coronary artery disease, they need to be on metformin or sulfonylurea or have a reason why they can't be on them. And then we can't have a special authorization in their system for another class. So citagliptin is a common one that a lot of patients come on. on. Uncontrolled diabetes is considered an HbA1c of greater than 7% for most patients. Um, we have been able to argue when patients have uncontrolled glucose readings within the hospital, I have been able to get them on separate agents at that point. Still currently not approved for the heart failure indication, but the apoglifosin criteria should hopefully change soon. They are reviewing it. It's currently all based on price from what I'm told and uh, Jardiance is still um, not being reviewed at this point, but the majority of private drug plans are covering these. The GLP-1s, uh, Ozempic is now on the formulary. They don't have anything specific to current uh, coronary artery disease, just for patients have to be a second agent uh, to metformin. Insulins are all covered except for Lantus. Lantus is no longer covered. Um, and then Detrimere or Levomere needs a special authorization, but that's not started too often anymore as a first line. And then DPP-4 inhibitors, all of them require special authorization. But other than that, um, most other agents are covered. And then most private plans are covering the DPP-4 inhibitors. It's just the GLP-1, sometimes we do have to check prior uh, approval because uh, they kind of have some criteria on them as well as with the provincial plan. So that is it for me today. I probably flew through that, but if you have any questions or comments, feel free. That's great. Thanks, Christine. I appreciate that. That's fantastic. So I'm going to, um, I'm just going to start off with a couple of questions and anybody who's, uh, yeah, why don't you just flip to your guideline slide there and just so that people have a reference Sure. once, once they've done laughing at the comic. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so just uh, from my standpoint, I've got two questions for you. Number one is that just your sense, I mean, obviously we have a high percentage of patients who are diabetic who come in uh, to the heart center, your sense of how well they're being managed in the periphery, it's obviously not straightforward. I mean, these are guidelines that are constantly evolving that are coming out on a regular basis. And um, I mean, there's a lot of research being done in this area. Um, and uh, so just from your standpoint, how well these patients are being managed in the periphery so that when they do come here, are we reasonably safe, especially say post-cardiac surgery when obviously their sugars tend to be a little bit more volatile, are we fairly safe just kind of reestablishing their pre-existing medication regimen or is it incumbent upon us to try to make some changes um, to, to their portfolio? I definitely feel like we're probably making more changes um, than keeping patients on their current regimen. Most of the time they're not on an SGLT2 inhibitor, which we really should be pushing to get pretty much all of our patients on at that point. Um, but majority of it is just drug coverage or it just hasn't been looked at this point because either they're in an acute situation or um, they've kind of fallen through the cracks, I guess you could say. But that's the, the one thing that I am noticing is a lot of patients aren't on it. I do tend to notice past over the past couple of months, it does seem that more patients are at least being started on it, especially when they're coming to us from periphery hospitals. So it, I feel like it's starting, it's just been a little slow in the uptake of it. Yeah, Christina, I wonder if there's a, um... I, I still find it hard to navigate with all the information in general as it's evolving. Uh, and so the guidelines is helpful. So there's a resource there, but do you think there'd be an ability to have, I don't know, like a, a simple cue card sort of algorithm that we could have as our, not our policy, but as a way that we could advertise on our, you know, have it in, in front of the computer by when we see patients, just something a little more, doesn't have to be exceedingly detailed, but you know, here, make sure that this, that, and the other is dealt with pre and post and that kind of stuff. Did you think about the STLT2? Like, am I, am I on it? You know, just to make sure that all of us, when I run on a weekend, I don't forget, you know, what are your thoughts around that? 
I think it would be great to do. I think it just gets too complicated with patients when they're renal failure or they're in an acute kidney injury or drug coverage is always seems to be the biggest barrier currently right now. Okay. Still so a majority so of our patients are either paying cash or they're on the provincial plan. And that seems to be the, the hurdle. Yeah. So it's they hard still to standardize. Self- so it's yeah. hard to standardize at the moment. Yeah, yeah that they still recommend to be the big barrier for me. Yeah, and they still recommend the sulfonylureas as a second option for most of the time, just because they're cheap. They don't really have any evidence, so they're not going to benefit the patient. But um, that's still the obviously everything comes down to cost with the drug formula. Okay. Yeah, and I, I would have to second JF's uh, comment there. I am in the same boat. One of the main reasons I asked you to give this talk was just because. I think it's good not only to know where the resources are, but also to understand that there is an algorithm in place, you know, for a lot of these patients. But, you know, I do inherently rely on you a lot, which is, uh, which is a good thing. I mean, that's part of the, what the program is designed for. But having said that, it's not always straightforward. I guess my last question for you is around just people who are very poorly controlled. I know you touched upon this a little bit in terms of baseline hemoglobin A1Cs and but you know, your one of your cases really brought up a, a scenario that we're seeing not infrequently, which is these uncontrolled diabetics with really high random glucoses when they first show up on the scene. You know, in the high teens, low twenties, and um, you know, to what extent do we initiate insulin in these patients, uh, and uh, and should we be doing it more often? And then. I guess my follow-up question to that is because we are so reliant on you as our kind of our diabetic management person, we no longer really go to endocrinology ever uh, and bring in their help, but is this something that we should be doing more or is it fairly reasonable to kind of work through you and then bring them only in for like, when do we, when do we ever bring them in? That's a good question. I haven't seen, (laughs) I haven't seen it happen too often. Um, I think the patients that we can't control. um, So Currently, there, there is a patient on the floor right now that I've tried three different long-acting insulins for, and still he's having lows in the morning and then spiking to 20s by lunch, and it doesn't matter kind of what we're doing, and I feel like he would be one that we'd need to um, have for endocrinology, but then we're also limited with our options because he has, his EGFR is probably less than 30, so I'm limited on oral options at that point. Um, and so if you think maybe the more complicated patients or the patients who have been um, having significant difficulties with their management might be the other options. Cause I feel like I I'm, I'm pretty good, but I'm obviously not an endocrinologist. So I can't help with everything, but yeah. And we are definitely starting more people on insulin. I feel that that's, that is happening. Um, but then I, most of the time they've either been on insulin before or they knew that that was the next step that was coming. So I think that maybe the surgery just kind of pushed them over to that stage. And admittedly, it is a challenge when you're now trying to recover from surgery, learn all that there is to know about surgical recovery and or whatever it is that you're recovering from at the heart center, and then learn how to then use insulin on top of that. So, I mean, you sometimes don't want to hit too many people with too many things. Um, All right. Well, Christina, thank you for that overview. That's excellent. I think this is one of those talks where uh, I will definitely be reviewing it on, <laughs> on YouTube when I post it, just because I think it's one of those things I could watch over and over and I'm still missing the odd thing. So I thank you for that summary and that's fantastic. I really wanted to kind of uh, take this opportunity to, uh, to advertise the next two sessions. I think they'll be of great interest and I will uh, advertise them fairly in advance too. Uh, Dr. Duncan Webster from Infectious Diseases is gonna be speaking to us on COVID-19 more specifically Um, He's going to give us two sessions back to back. The first session is going to be on the logic uh, and uh, the diagnostics uh, that we are using locally uh, here for COVID-19. And then the second talk will be about immunizations and specifically about uh, whether or not we're sort of going by the book or not, and then where the variants fall into all of this. So I think very timely conversation, especially as we uh, had our first case in the CCU Uh, just in the past 24 hours. Obviously, they're now in the COVID unit uh, where we've identified the UK variant now in St. John. Uh, I think these are hot topics and where, let's be honest, there is is talk of a third wave. Uh, So uh, all of these things are going to be discussed in some way, shape or form uh, over the next two sessions with Dr. Duncan Webster. Everyone uh, have a great day uh, and thank you so much for attending.